Well, hello everyone and welcome back to another Vibrant Music Teacher Chat. It is wonderful to be with you today and we're here to talk about scales. Did you like practicing scales when you were learning piano? A lot of us maybe didn't so much or maybe didn't practice them at all, even now. Today we're going to be looking at how we can make scales fun and interesting, even in online lessons, it doesn't matter whether you're teaching in Zoom or in person, scales do not have to be boring. So I'm going to share some ideas with you today to help you to make them more interesting. Let's get started. Hey everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome to those chiming in in the chat. We've got lots of you saying hi already. So great to have you all here. We've got Morgan and Julie and Carrie and Charlotte, lots of regulars in the room as well as maybe some newbies. If you are new, please do chime in and say hi to us. We love to welcome a new viewers, I was about to say listeners, <laughs> new um, community members really here in the chat in our YouTube channel. Hey to Laurie who's joining us again, Kathy and Claire, uh, Alien Hats from Sweden, you can tell me your real name there when you get a chance, great to see you joining us anyway. Sarah, Eloise, awesome! Oh my gosh, so many people joining us from all over the world to talk about scales. It's such an exciting topic, I just couldn't keep you away, right? Is that how you feel about scales? Right? Yes? Hi to Navia, oh, sorry, Elizabeth, is it? In Belize and Cindy in Kentucky, you're all over the globe today. Maybe this time suits slightly better in an even broader range. That is absolutely awesome. We are doing these chats three times a week, so if you are joining us for the first time, we would love it if you were able to come back again next time. We are on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays at the moment with various different music teaching and piano teaching topics. And we dive into them, we explore a little bit, I answer any of your questions live and we build up our online community at a time when many of us don't have a physical community to talk to. And many of us don't anyway, right? As music teachers, we're just here in our own little bubble, sometimes wondering whether we're doing things right, whether we're an imposter, whether we should even be allowed to do this at all. And it's good to... Tune in to our online community and see, hey, lots of other people feel like that too, and we're all just doing the best we can, and we're all, I think, you're all doing a fantastic job, especially in the current circumstances, at keeping up with all this stuff. So as you do join us, let me know about your experience with scales, with teaching scales, and with learning scales. And in webinars I've done about scales in the past, I have heard from teachers who hate scales themselves. And I've been honest about that. And the fact that that makes it even harder to teach them, right? Because you don't even believe they can be interesting. So do you believe they can be interesting? Let me know. And if you do, does that carry over to your students? Do they find them interesting or do they sometimes find them dull? And Nan said, I'm actually quite a music nerd and I love the form and pattern of scales. My students, however, don't always share my enthusiasm. So true, Nan. Um, I'm, you know, I have a bit of a mathematical brain, so I've always actually, not always, but since I realized the pattern behind scales, and that's something maybe I didn't catch on to straight away, but once I realized that element of them, I, I tuned into that as well, Nan, and that was useful for me and suited my brain. Uh, Carrie said she secretly likes them too. That's awesome. You don't have to be secret about them. If you find them fun, say you find them fun. I have some students at the moment who've just started on proper scales, shall we say, one, one octave scales, having done pentascales, and they tell me how much they love them, and I'm like, yeah, they're fun, aren't they? And I just don't say anything, 
<laughs> the fact that a lot of people maybe don't like them as much. Okay, so I've got some ideas for you today, but I'd love to hear yours too. And we have a lot more ideas like this, by the way, inside VMT. So if you're not a member, if you are a member, you can find lots of more ra scale resources inside the library, in the video library and the printable library. If you're not a member, you can sign up using our coupon. That'll be valid for another couple of weeks. So you're going to want to hop to that if you've been thinking about it. The coupon code is online and that will get you a one week trial for just one dollar so that you can test it out at a time when a lot of us are dealing with COVID and um, difficult economic situations and everything. So if you want to test out membership, if you're not a member, I see lots of members here live as well, but if you want to join us inside, that's how you can sign up vibrantmusicteaching.com using the coupon code online. So my first idea for scales um, is one that many of you will be familiar with, but this works just as well in online lessons as it does in person. Anybody use that one? That one? Food rhythms? Yeah, that's a go-to one, isn't it? If you are not doing food rhythms, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, I will explain myself in a second. But even if you're already doing it, I want to make sure that you're doing this with student suggestions involved. So we don't want to just do our designed rhythms. We want to ask our students for their favorite foods. Everyone has favorite foods. And make those into our scale rhythms. So, you know, we do lasagna, lasagna. Okay. Um, lasagna was my favorite food when I was a kid. That's why I chose it. <laughs> but whatever your kid comes up with, you take that and you apply it to their scales. It's an instant way to make people more enthusiastic about practicing their scales. Uh, Eloise says, yes, food rhythms. Absolutely. Like I said, it's a go-to tactic for many teachers, but if you're not doing it, or if you're not taking student requests for it, it is absolutely one of the best and easiest things to do. And like I say, it works great on online. And you can even surprise your students by quickly looking up a picture of the food that they suggested, right? And then showing it on your screen. So you quickly look up some lasagna like I'm doing right now. You can see me clicking around. <laughs> and... Here we go. But you would do this without talking through it. <laughs> and then you screen share or you throw it up on your screen like that. Maybe put it in front of your face if you're able to do this. Or just put it over your full screen like that. And when they turn back from doing their scale, suddenly the food has appeared on the screen. You can do silly little things like that. Yes, it has nothing to do with music. But your student is probably capable of playing their scale by themselves for a second. And with you listening in the kind of in the back of your head. So you can do fun things like look up their, f <laughs> their food and throw it onto the screen. And then ask for more suggestions and keep going. Hours of fun. Okay, maybe not hours. Let's not do this for hours. But still, minutes of fun, right? Minutes of fun with scales is a good goal. Laurie, that's interesting. You've never heard of this? Hop to it. Try it out. I think you'll love it. Sharon, first for you too, as it relates to playing scales. That's interesting. That's like a go-to thing. I guess I do think some of these things, like the scale stuff, I know you're all probably teaching scales or a lot of you are teaching scales in the US. It's not that you're not doing it. However, we do have an extra pressure put on teaching scales in countries where we use exam systems a lot. And so we have these sets that we have to get through. And some of you have, I know, have things that you do like that for MTAs and stuff. But um, yeah, 
scale practice strategies tend to come to the fore when you have to do an exam. As several of my students are preparing for right now, online. First online exam experience, it's been a really interesting one. Yes, same in Canada, for sure. I was just referring to the US there, man, where the exams aren't quite so prevalent, but as we saw in our music teacher survey last year, Canada, UK, Ireland, uh, Australia, New Zealand, everywhere except, everywhere English-speaking country except the US, had 80% of students, the average was 80% had some students doing exams. So 80% of teachers had some students doing exams. Whereas in the US, it was almost the exact opposite, where I think it was 75% had no students ever doing exams. Just a different perspective from different parts of the world, which I think is interesting. Okay, here's my next, next scale teaching tactic. <laughs> Found objects. This is a bit more mysterious. What am I talking about here? Well, on one of my scales lists in a blog post, which is called Seven Ways to Practice Scales, very predictably, I suggest using hedgehogs. Do I have my hedgehog? No, they're not here. But I suggest using hedgehogs there. What I do have here is rainbows and cupcakes. So I suggest using things like this, little erasers that you can put on the keys. Uh, let me show you what that looks like. Right, and have your student lay them out. And that's what we'd do at the studio. We'd do A major and we'd lay it all out. However, they do not necessarily have a little set of erasers. But you can get them to find anything around their gaff, as we say, uh, around the house that they can put on. Now I have a bunch of pens here. So that would work. There's a random whiteboard eraser from Ultimate Music Theory. There's my chapstick. What else do we have? I have... Oh, now here's a good note. This is dangerous. This is a little bit of post-it. Ban them from using a piece of paper because they might go between the keys and get lost forever and you might hurt their instrument and then their parent would be very upset with you. Paper clips. Let's test them out here. Still a bit thin for my liking. I can push them down through. Now they wouldn't fall, but mm, it's risky. What else do we have here? That's way too big. Hmm. Here's my glasses cleaner. Okay, you get the idea, right? I'm just picking up anything and they can do that at home. They can run through their room and find any small objects and you can be doing the same so that you can show them like a variety of things that would work for those who don't necessarily always think that creatively right away. The benefit of laying scales out like this rather than just playing them is thinking about them differently. So here's the thing. For me, scales are not technique and fingering patterns only. That is just a small part of what they are for. They are also for understanding theory, knowing key signatures, being able to navigate chords. All of these things can come from scales. But as teachers, sometimes we assume that they will come from scales and they won't unless you teach them in the right way. Up until probably about 10 years into my studies, I could have played any scale for you but I couldn't have told you what was in it. Not ten years, maybe eight, right? If someone asked me, okay, what are the flats in D flat major? I'd have to think it. I'd have to, like, literally look, stare at the piano and go, that's me visualizing the different keys, right? And that's slow. And that isn't all that useful in terms of theory knowledge. It takes a long time and if your students don't have a good mental piano it's useless in a theory exam. They have, well, they can draw a picture of piano and I do have younger students do that but it's not ideal, is it? So having students lay out the scale on the keys is a great way for them to be able to map it silently without playing it. It also helps students, those kiddos who 
just do this. That's horrible to listen to, I'm not going to keep going. Um, you get the idea though, right? Who just play through it and play the wrong key and then fix it and then play the right key. They're just using their ear. They never learn the actual scale. <laughs> and that is not very useful. I mean, it's good ear training, I guess, but it's not very useful. Claire, I love that. Small Lego pieces. Yeah, if they have Lego around, that's great, because that can't go between the keys, can it? So that's perfect. Nice. Okay, so that's my second idea. Um, you love the idea of, uh, sorry, for online lessons, would it be hard to see the exact keys they put them on since you won't have a view from the top? Yes, true, but then they need to tell you what keys are on. If you can't see, you just ask them and that gives them another reinforcement of what keys are in the scale. Sure, they can lie to you, but then they still need to know what the correct key is to tell you the correct one, right? So, yeah. Just get them to say them out loud if you don't have a clear enough view. The next idea is say it, don't play it. It leads very neatly on, doesn't it? It's like I planted Lee's question there for me to bring you on to say it, don't play it. So this is what it sounds like. They have to tell you all of the somethings in a scale without playing anything. And I like to specify without touching the keys, because a lot of kiddos actually want to use their muscle memory and just sort of tap on the surface of the keys to test these things out. So what I would get, be getting them to say is either the notes or the finger numbers. Both are very useful and will help them practice different things. Either way, they're not allowed to actually play anything as they go through. They're just saying it. So just, you say, okay, tell me all the notes in the A major scale and they need to tell you them without playing it first. Does that make sense? Simple strategy, but very effective. Morgan, yeah. You've always had a mental piano and have not thought to use that term aloud. Yes, an important note is that not everyone does. And sometimes we forget that, that that's actually quite abstract thinking. And when you say you've always had it, you probably didn't always have it. Like, at some point in your childhood, without you noticing, right, you developed this mental piano. And I did too. I couldn't tell you when it happened. But I'm sure if you asked me when I was seven to picture a piano, when I first started, I couldn't have done it, right? So, at some stage we developed that, but it is not straight away. And... Having students not able to visualize that can get in the way when they are doing written work and stuff like that and they're not beside a piano. So I have them draw a picture, like I said, of a piano, but that's just one way to handle it. Okay, the next way is in writing. This can be either on the staff, if you have your student... If your student has manuscript paper, if that's something you include in their folder or anything like that, um, and or they have a manuscript notebook, they can write it out on the staff. Or it could be in a, in a notation app if they have an iPad, or in MuseScore, or um, something where they can notate it themselves online or digitally. But it can also just be the letters. Or the piano. So you get them to draw a piano. Where's my whiteboard? So on my whiteboard, we have to clear off my found objects. So on my whiteboard, I have a random set of rhythms. Isn't that handy? I didn't prepare the whiteboard for this, as you can see. On my, my whiteboard here, um, I have this piano already. So you get, get your student to write out to draw their own piano. What am I even doing? That's not the correct fingering. One, two, right? And they would leave gaps in the black keys so that you could actually see what they draw there. 
Uh, yeah, I can, Morgan. Morgan asked, can I demonstrate how I would quickly draw a piano? For sure. Let's just wipe off the back of this. It has a bunch of chords on it. Those of you who came along to the chord demonstration last week will be familiar with that map. It was from one of my students' lessons yesterday. If you didn't catch that one, you can find the replay here on the channel. So, how I would quickly draw a piano. I tend to draw the black keys first. So that's what I tell students to do. And it can be very rough. And then I go down. Right? This can clarify for you too if your student actually doesn't um, understand the, the patterns very clearly. I can clarify that for you. It doesn't have to be pretty. Students usually do a better job than me, but I demonstrate really roughly always so that they can know this is not a drawing competition. You know, some kids can be a bit sensitive about their drawing skills because it's like a big thing in school. So just do it very roughly. A two octave piano is useful for scale, so I'd have them do two octaves actually. There. Um, but then if they're drawing them on that, so then they can write out their scale fingering or whatever on their drawn piano. What am I doing with my numbers today, guys? I can't count. And then I'll keep going. It can be two octaves, it can be whatever. And then uh, if they have a staff or if they draw a staff, then they could draw it on the staff as well and you can specify which it is. And to go back to Lee's question earlier, if they have drawn it on a piece of paper and you need to check it, you just have them hold it up to the camera, right? Just hold it up close and they can keep angling it until you get it, they get it right and you say stop, right? These things do not have to be perfect and seamless and beautiful. They can be rough, at least I think they can, and they can still be extremely effective in terms of learning. Sarah, I got that cool whiteboard from my friend Glory St. Germain from Ultimate Music Theory. So she sent it to me as a gift with, along with some other stuff because of some stuff we did together, which was really lovely of her. But yeah, ultimatemusictheory.com. You can see it there. That is her website and I'm sure she sells them there. Okay, so. Uh, what was I about to say? Oh yeah, next idea. Finger sync. I think Laurie is still live. So I've taken your brain sync and we turned it into finger sync, Laurie. So this is going to be for scales. You play the start of the scale and tell your student you're going to stop at some random point and then they are going to pick it up from there. So you say to them, okay, we're going to play D flat major. Wherever I stop, you need to continue from there. I would give them a couple of options, or depending on the kids, you can choose which would be most appropriate. But you can either tell them to ghost it while you're playing so that they can keep track, or you can ban them from doing that if they should be pretty good at it, and have them jump in in the middle, right? So you start it, and you just stop. And you say, go! And they need to pick up from there, right? They're continuing from there. And then you can pass back and forth. So you can have them stop in a random spot. I think it's fun for them to be able to do it too because it shows that, yeah, you do actually know your skills too. <laughs> you're able to keep up with them, right? And it's good to show them that you're up for the challenge too. Uh, yes, Laurie is still here. Yeah, it's such a great idea. Laurie shared this in terms of pieces originally. So a piece that your student knows well and you stop randomly in the middle and then they need to pick it up from there and they can stop and then you pick it up and vice versa, back and forth. And I think it's great for scales as well. With that modification of they can ghost the scale while you're playing and then start physically playing from there when you stop. Right? I think it could be a lot of fun. I'm going to be doing that with my buddy students, having them do that to each other. The ones that know the same scales or at least some over overlap. And my last, is my last idea? Yes, one fingered. I always share this one, so you may have heard it before from me. 
but I think it is one of the best ways to practice scales and it sounds so silly because we th- if you think of them very traditionally like as if they're practicing of muscle memory and finger patterns then this is sacrilege this is ridiculous why would I ask them to practice with one finger but honestly they have to think about it so much when they do it they can't play them by muscle memory they usually don't play them by ear because they slow themselves down enough that they don't so I normally specify first I just tell them to do it with finger two right so the first one I might say okay can you play the whole scale of D major with only finger two of your right hand so they're just doing it that way and then sorry slightly funny angle there isn't it and then I start saying weird fingers. Okay, so can you play D flat with your fifth finger of your left hand and your first finger of your right hand? So. Like that. And my favorite one is to make them then, when they've done a similar motion. Okay, now can you use finger three of your right hand and finger four of your left hand and play in contrary motion? That is a challenge, right? I'm not going to lie, it is not easy for students, but that's the whole point. It's all about keeping people thinking. Don't ever allow scales to be autopilot mode. Unless you're aiming for speed, and that's a whole other thing. But most of the time, when I'm doing scale practice with students in lessons, I don't want the autopilot. I don't want to see that. I want to see that they understand them, that they can think through them, that if they get derailed, they're going to know where they are, right? It's not pure muscle memory. Lee, would I use one of these ideas each week or several in one lesson? A couple in a lesson, maybe two or three in one lesson for different scales, just to keep mixing things up. Um, Yeah, most of the time that's what I would do. Um... Uh, Laurie, sorry. My question is, do you teach the scales clockwise all the way through or do you do the sharp scales and then go back and start at C and go counterclockwise for the flats in terms of the circle of fifths? So Laurie, what I tend to do is I go uh, from C down to B, then go back to F uh, and then do the flats from there. So yeah, it's kind of the second thing you said. So I go that way. The reason I do that is not because, um, well, the reason I do that is because B flat is the hardest scale, in my opinion. It is the one that it takes my students the longest to get by far. So while I want to give them that uh, reinforcement of the pattern initially and get them used to that standard, quote unquote, standard pattern, for the white keys and then the slight deviations with B and F. I do want that comfort level initially, but then I want to jump into B flat so that they're practicing that for longer as we go through that I have lots of time to review that. Not that anything expires or anything, but you see what I mean. As we go to E flat, A flat, etc. and are working through all 12 major keys, B flat gets lots and lots of time to be embedded. And then at the end of that, they're doing the Apprentice Challenge. So they're trying to play the scales with the iReal Pro backing track that we use. And you can find that in the library if you're interested in it. Helena, I place my paper keyboard on the magnetic boards and use magnets for scales, chords and more. Yeah, that's a great way to demonstrate things. And Morgan, that's awesome. Uh, I don't even know how that would look. She said she's going to apply it to violin, even using one finger scales for intonation. Yet, yeah, I don't understand how that would function because my my violin knowledge is not thorough enough. But that's great that it sparked an idea for that. I think you can absolutely bleed things into different instruments and all of that stuff. I want every instrument to be taught creatively. It's just that I only play the piano, so I can't help with other things <laughs> very much. 
Sarah, how much time do I spend in a lesson on scales and how many scales per lesson do I hear? Oh my gosh, it's a bit of a string question, Sarah. Uh, how much time do I spend in a lesson on scales? If we're, if we have a lot of scales on the go, like if it's a student who's close to uh, mastering all 12 keys and we're doing a lot of review of those, let's say they're almost ready for scale apprentice level, so they know they know all 12 keys or they're pretty close to that and we're really going back over things. That might take a little bit more time and it would tend to be done during our buddy lesson time where I have my two students together. And that might take five minutes. Yeah, five minutes. Um, but a generous five minutes. For kids who are working on like one scale at a time and they have a couple to review... Two minutes? That's all. Not long. Don't want to burn them out on scales. Depends what stage they're at. If they're actually working on passing the apprentice challenge, that will take a chunk of time. But as with anything, any of my challenges that I use, which are different leveled systems for students passing off different stuff, and people who are interested in that, by the way, can look up the blog for more info on that. But, um... If they're working on that kind of assessment, I guess, where they're doing the iReal Pro backing track and they're playing through the whole thing, that will take more like five to ten minutes out of their lesson. But it's only for, you know, maximum four weeks. Okay. Awesome. I'm so glad you guys have got some new ideas. I hope everyone who's watching has found at least one new idea to try with scales in online lessons or in-person lessons if you're back to teaching in person at the moment. And I hope you had fun. I certainly enjoyed hanging out with you all today. It's been a busy chat today, which is awesome. And let us know your scale ideas if you're watching on the replay. Also, make sure to subscribe to the channel so that you get notified about the next one of these. And like this video. If you did get an idea out of it, give it a little like. It helps show YouTube that you valued this content, that you thought it was a good thing, and that YouTube should show it to more people. Because otherwise, YouTube, I mean, it's a robot. It's not going to know whether or not this video is useful and actually helpful to people, and I hope that you did find out it was, and you'll hit the like button to show YouTube that that is the case. Thank you all so much for doing that. Okay, excuse me, I will be back on Friday, and I'm looking forward to hanging out with you all then. We're going to be talking about an interesting topic, authority versus funness as a music teacher. This has been something that's come up a lot for teachers recently as they've gone online because maybe our control has been eroded a little bit because we're in the home environment essentially. We're in the students' homes when we weren't maybe normally and different other factors that have made it tricky for us to keep our control and our authority over the situation and we're thinking about that balance. So this is something that was suggested on last week's chat and we're going to be talking about it on Friday as well as taking your suggestions for topics for next week. So I hope to see you all then. If you're not a member make sure to sign up so I can see you inside our community as well using the coupon code online at vibrantmusicteaching.com and I will see all the members in between now and then inside the community and otherwise I'll see you back here on the YouTube channel on Friday. Talk to y'all then.